So I'm gone today for cross country. So I, I made a video or I'm making this video uh, for the psychology classes to go back over classical conditioning and, and start operant conditioning. So both the days we've done classical conditioning and as well as start operant conditioning. Um, I have a study guide that goes over this whole unit here that I should have given you earlier, but um, I didn't. So you have that now, you should have that in front of you. And uh, so we'll go back over what we've done in the last two days, as well as start operant conditioning, the types, and then the schedules of reinforcement we'll go over on Monday or Tuesday, depending on what hour you are. So there is the unconditioned stimulus, the unconditioned response, the neutral stimulus, which is the conditioned stimulus, the, um, and the conditioned response that a lot bigger so for the the unconditioned stimulus is a stimulus a, a object or behavior that has an automatic response so uh, in the Pavlov dog example Pavlov fed his dog uh, but rang a bell before he fed his dog every single time and then uh, the dog would salivate just to the sound of the bell so in that case the unconditioned stimulus was the food which had a natural response of the salivation. And then um, Pavlov would bring the bell, and the bell eventually would have the dog to, to salivate as well. So the unconditioned stimulus is the thing that has an automatic, um, an automatic, something that has an automatic response. And then the unconditioned response is the automatic response. The neutral stimulus is a completely unrelated object that always f precedes the unconditioned stimulus. And then you, the person or, or animal learns that the neutral stimulus predicts the presence of the unconditioned stimulus, so then the response is always similar, uh, but not exactly, not necessarily always exactly the same as the uh, unconditioned response. Cool. Let's flip over to the um, page that you got. So it's classical conditioning. Pair two things together so that the second thing elicits a similar reaction to the first thing. That's classical conditioning. So classical conditioning, pair two things together. We've already learned about that. And that uh, can explain why phobias exist. And a phobia is an illogical or irrational fear of something. So fear of um, an actually dangerous situation would not be a phobia, but fear of... Like if, you, if you're afraid of poisonous spider, then that could be a phobia, but fear of just a, a normal spider would be closer to a phobia, and fear of a picture of a spider like I have it would, be a, would be a phobia. There are ways to decondition phobias, and we talked about this last day in class, uh, starting with systematic sensitization. Systematic sensitization is a way to expose yourself to a phobia, which will eventually cause extinction, which is where the um, condition response won't happen with the conditioned stimulus anymore. Like if the dog no longer salivated the sound of the bell, if Pavlov kept ringing the bell over and over and over without giving the bell food, without giving the dog food, then eventually the dog would stop salivating to the sound of the bell. So with systematic sensitization, that's a way to decondition a phobia, like uh, if you're afraid of dogs and then you expose yourself to dogs. But systematic sensitization is gradually using a hierarchy of fears. So the hierarchy of fears is the list of 1 to 10 um, where you get gradually more and more anxiety provoking on the list, that, those two go together. And then flooding is exposure all at once. So that would be you just go to a dog park and, and deal with the anxiety until you calm down. Um, ah, I didn't talk about spontaneous recovery. So after extinction, so if Pavlov um, rang the bell a bunch of times without giving the dog food, then eventually the dog would extinguish the salivation response to the bell. That's extinction. But if Pavlov did that 15 times in a row and then he rang the bell and then immediately gave the dog food, the next time if he rang the bell, probably the dog would start salivating to the bell again. So that's when once the conditioned stimulus is paired with the unconditioned stimulus again, uh, the behavior will reassociate itself even quicker than in the first place. Let's see. And that is classical conditioning. I think that covered everything. Um, 
yeah, I think that's the last two days. So now we're going on to operant conditioning. So this is Skinner. I talked about the uh, Pavlov is the guy with the dog, drilled the hole in the dog's throat to measure salivation. Skinner is the guy with the hungry pigeon. So let's watch that video. And YouTube's not going to like this because it's going to think I'm plagiarizing. But that's okay. Um, so let's see. We'll start with this one. So here is, uh, I'm going to bring myself off here. There we go. So here is a uh, Skinner, BF Skinner, with his pigeon. Oops. Can pigeons read? This one gives every indication. Because he's been taught to distinguish between two words and to behave appropriately. He's learned his different response to each sign by being rewarded with food. So the bird isn't acting independently. Its behavior is shaped by controlling its environment. The first task was to isolate an individual piece of behavior and see how that could be changed. Skinner did this by keeping individual pigeons at about three quarters of their normal weight so that the birds were always hungry and food could be used as an automatic reward. The pigeon was studied in a uniform box, one it quickly grew used to. One piece of behavior, pecking a colored disc, was measured on a graph. The pigeon learned that pecking the disc produced a reward. Then the behavior of pecking could be studied in relation to how often that reward was offered, or in Skinner's terms, what was the schedule of reinforcement? The schedule. We won't talk about schedule of reinforcement yet. Uh, so, classical conditioning, come on. Classical conditioning is pairing two things together. Operant conditioning, I'm gonna bring up paint here. Operant conditioning is uh, shaping behaviors through rewards and punishment. So with rewards and punishment, you can make behavior more or less frequent. I'm gonna try and draw a grid here. Put a little extra something there. Take that out, cool. Uh, so, you work with this grid of positive, negative reinforcement and punishment. And you can have any of the combinations of these four things. Reinforcement. And punishment. Now, the thing that's counterintuitive is that positive doesn't mean good and negative doesn't mean bad. So, um, positive just means adding something and negative means taking something away. So, adding, taking away. This is what's gonna be on the worksheet today and what'll be on the quizzes to come as well. And then reinforcement is if it's going to increase behavior, punishment is if, if, if what you're doing is going to decrease behavior. So, an example, so talking about dogs, an example of what you could do that would be positive reinforcement, think about what you could add to a dog that would make the dog uh, do something more often. So like if a dog does something you like, what would you add to the dog to make it do something more often? And usually what uh, students say is something like treats, which would be true. So treats would be an example of positive reinforcement, adding something to make the dog uh, sit down more often when you ask it to sit down. Let's see, what else can I think of as positive reinforcement? Uh, oh, well, saying good boy would be positive reinforcement because you're adding good boy. Um, you're adding that, and so that makes it positive. The thing that doesn't really make as much sense, and you just have to remember, is positive punishment is adding something to reduce a behavior. So if your dog does something bad, what could you do to your dog? And you could spray it with a water bottle and that would be positive punishment because it, it, it's punishment in that it reduces the frequency of behavior. So if your dog jumps up on the counter and you spray it with water, it's gonna do jump up on the counter behavior less often, which means it's punishment. And you're adding the water, which means that it's positive. Um, you could also, <laughs> I'm not even gonna uh, say that. Well, you could hit your dog, but I'm not even gonna write that there. So don't hit your dog. Let's see, negative, negative. 
Negative reinforcement is taking away something bad to reward the dog. That one's pretty weird. So negative reinforcement would be like uh, taking away shock collar for good behavior. Uh, which gets pretty weird, but it's taking away something. So negative taking away to make to to reward the dog, so the dog does something more often, or taking away a bark collar or something if he's really good at the dog park and doesn't bark. Negative punishment would be uh, taking a, taking away something that that's going to punish the dog. So like taking away food, which sounds super mean. You could also taking away toys, both of which are pretty sad. Um, that would all be negative punishment. So taking away things to uh, decrease behavior. If you're talking about children, positive reinforcement could be like, um, well, it, kind of the same thing. Saying good boy, uh, positive punishment it would, I guess, be spanking a child because you're adding a spank and that's going to make a child do something less often. And again, positive doesn't mean good, and negative doesn't mean bad. Positive just means adding, and negative means taking something away. And negative reinforcement would be taking away something bad. That's always the, it's the grid that's the weirdest. So taking away something that's bad would be, uh, well, if you were really good in class and I was going to give you homework and I didn't, would be negative reinforcement. Taking away something to reward you. Negative punishment would be like uh, a timeout. Mm. This you just have to memorize because it doesn't completely make sense. But timeout is always negative punishment. So timeout is like taking away freedom. It just That's just what it is. Let's see. Uh, mm, we won't talk about that yet. Um, the Skinner box, it's also called an operant conditioning chamber. That's Skinner's box that he conditions pigeons in. Uh, well, that's just about it. Tomorrow we'll talk about... Um, chaining more complex behaviors. Let's see. But the box that, that Skinner did uh, immediately, so here's a, a box, I don't know who did this. Eddie pushing the lever. Uh, so here's a Skinner box with a rat here that someone has made. It looks like a either a high school or a college. But it's a, a operant conditioning chamber in that the rat gets positive reinforcement when it pushes that thing. So originally the rat probably um, accidentally pressed it to start out, but now the rat's been trained that every time he presses that, he gets positively reinforced with food. So now he presses it more and more and more and more and more often. So operant conditioning is just a way to shape behavior. You can increase or decrease the frequency of behavior um, based on punishments or, or rewards. And this will work for, you can train your dog like this, you can train your parents like this, your friends like this, your teachers like this, in that if uh, when your teacher's doing something that you like, you tend to be more, you smile more and you ask more questions and that positively reinforces the teacher. And when the teacher does something you don't like, you tend to use um, negative punishment and you aren't as friendly to them and that kind of thing, which ends up shaking your teacher. And you're not even really trying to, but you are. Let's see, I think that's it. Let's go over, so take out now your, um, take out the worksheet and we'll go over the first few together and then we'll go over the rest when I get back. But I don't mind if you work in groups with this. So, uh, starting with number one. Oh, the way this works is for this one you write either P or N for positive or negative and for the second blank you write reinforcement or punishment. So you'll end up with something like P, N or, or whatever. So number one, a woman watching a football game offers her child to play candy to play quietly. And the first question you ask yourself is, is something being added or taken away? And in this case, the woman is adding candy. So it's going to be positive. And then the second question you ask is, is that going to decrease or increase the behavior? So is play quietly going to increase in frequency or decrease in frequency because of the give candy? And it is going to increase in frequency. So that would be positive reinforcement. Uh, some of these, I need to write these myself. I took this from online and, and some of them aren't very straightforward. When I do give a quiz, it'll be really straightforward. Uh, at a party, you become angry when your significant other flirts with another person. 
So first of all, is something being added or taken away? And it's a little ambiguous, uh, but I would argue that becoming angry is adding anger. So in that case, I would say positive. And then according to what she's intending to do, or he's intending to do, is that going to make flirt with another person happen more or less often? And at least hopefully, according to the person that's becoming angry, but maybe not in reality, it is uh, going to be punishment. So you are adding the anger to decrease flirting. Uh, let's skip down a little bit to some of the harder ones. Ah, this one's hard. So a rat that is currently being shocked presses a lever and the shock goes away. Is something being added or taken away? And this one's more more uh, complex than than a lot of them, but the shock is being removed, so that would be negative, because we're terminating or stopping the shock. And now, is that going to make the rat press the lever more or less often? And it's going to make the rat press the lever more often, so that's reinforcement. Uh, it's this one has two parts, the first first half of the sentence and the second half. One last one that's not very easy, and the rest you can do on your own. A child's parents finally give in to his complaining at the grocery store and buy him a candy bar. Uh, something being added or taken away? It's being added because they're giving him candy. Now here's the weird part. Is that going to make his complaining happen more or less often? because he's getting a candy bar for complaining, and that's going to make his complaining happen more often, which is not what the parents want, but it's what's gonna happen. So that's positive reinforcement. Um, and that's it. So the rest of the class, uh, go through these examples, um, and I'll be back uh, on Tuesday. Have a good weekend.